I'm Kevin Davis, and this is the Catholic Family Podcast, and I'm very happy to be back in the saddle again. And, well, who better to come back with than Mr. Mario Dirksen, the man, the myth, the legend, the man behind NovusOrtoWatch.org, also um, Tradcast.org. He is providing all sorts of information covering the Novus Ordo, what's going on, what's been going on for the last 60, 70 years, kind of uncovering all the dirt, doing all the dirty work that nobody else wants to do. We all love him. We all appreciate him. And he is here today to talk about, well, something that is, of course, on the minds of many, and that is one of the most controversial figures of, well, the last 60 years, and that is Father Ratzinger, also known to the world as Pope Benedict XVI, who recently passed away. And before we get into that, before I get to Mario, I want to um, introduce our presenting sponsor. That is Benizzi Press. Now, Benizzi Press is a small publishing company um, from India, run by a good friend to the show. And there, he's, he's kind of getting up and running. He's, he's just at the beginning of starting to publish things. And he's just published online The Sacred Passion of Jesus Christ, Short Meditations for Every Day in Lent by Reverend Richard Frederick Clark of the Society of Jesus. Now, this has an imprimatur from 1889. I have not read it myself, but I fully trust Benizzi Press, and I highly recommend that you go and order this book. You can order it for just $2. You will need to click the link in the show notes, go to the, um, yeah, go to the, go where the link sends you, pay the $2 and buy this book, The Sacred Passion of Jesus Christ, just as we're about to prepare for Lent. And again, at Benizzi Press, go check them out. Mario, I want to send it over to you. And, and I think that as we all know, Benedict is really a strange figure because he is really revered by so many, even in the conservative Nova Soto. I, I think even, even sometimes among you know traditionalists, that he is kind of a guy who tried his best, you know, did his best to save Catholicism. And and I think you, you might have a, a little bit of a different version of of who he was. <laughs> yes, indeed. First of all, thank you very much for having me back, uh, Kevin. It's good to be on. Um, Merry Christmas and Happy Epiphany and Happy New Year. So yes, Benedict the Sixteenth died on December thirty first, twenty twenty two. He uh, was born on in nineteen twenty seven in uh, a little town called Marktel am Inn in uh, Germany. Bavaria. And or that's right where you are right now. Um, and he was ordained a priest in 1951 by Cardinal Faulhaber, who I believe was the Archbishop of Munich and Freising at the time. And uh, unfortunately, early on, he, it seems like he uh, was, uh, you know, had a certain love for novelty, which is exactly what St. Pius X said priests ought not to have. And uh, of course, Germany uh, had long been uh, a bit of a, shall we say, um, theologically, Germany was definitely problematic in the uh, 19th century and 20th century. Um, th that's not to say, of course, that every German priest was, you know, suspect or anything, not at all. But there were certain currents in theology that in Germany, uh, you just uh, I would I would look at anything coming out of Germany with um, suspicion, uh, at, at least from certain authors, and uh, Ratzinger uh, in particular uh, was one of them. Uh, and you know, it started early. Now, it, let me maybe just um, respond to uh, what you said with regard to the, this idea that Ratzinger was the great traditionalist. I think. He was able to um, influence or he was able to fool a lot of people with his Benedict the Sixteenth shtick, you know, by a return to the more beautiful vestments and, you know, more incense and uh, more Latin. And of course, then in 2007, the apparent freeing of the traditional Latin mass, I think. You know, a lot of people, um, understandably, they don't have, you know, the time or the means necessarily to research the person, Ratzinger, Joseph Ratzinger. Um, and so, you know, they see the outward appearance. Uh, they see what appears to be, um, you know, uh, trying to be conciliatory towards traditionalists. And so they will uh, take that and, um, you know, 
take it at face value and that will give them a good opinion of him. Uh, and so, you know, they'll say, oh, well, so with Samorum Pontificum, you know, I got my Latin mass and that's where I found the faith. And, you know, they'll, they'll have their own personal experience and then they'll extrapolate from that. And, you know, that, that will shape their whole opinion of, of everything. The question is, did you actually read Samorum Pontificum and did you see what Ratzinger says there? I mean, it, it includes, for example, it includes a flat out lie that the old mass had never been forbidden, but in principle always permitted. That's simply not true. And everybody knows it. And um, of course, you know, Ratzinger is still totally endorsing the new mass. He just wants the old mass alongside it. And then they're supposed to, oh, uh, what did he say? They're supposed to um, mutually enrich each other or, you know, something stupid like that. Um, there were a lot of problems with Samorum Pontificum. And of course, if all you care about is the externals of the Latin Mass, you know, preferably in a church near you, and maybe even a traditional church building, then sure, you're going you're gonna to love Samorum Pontificum because it gave you exactly that. Um, but if you're actually in it for the faith and the truth, and not just certain beautiful externals and conveniences and, and um, certain experiences, uh, then you're going to have a problem with it uh, because it puts the new mass and the old mass on the same plane. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it contains a number of unacceptable things. And of course, uh, it also uh, requires you still to adhere to Vatican II. And, you know, in no wise can the adherence to the traditional mass be a sign of your rejection of Vatican II. So if it's about the faith rather than the mass or the uh, at least the externals of the mass, because oftentimes it's offered by an invalid Novus Ordo priest, um, if you if you value, if you're interested, if you're in it for the truth and the true Catholic faith, then Samorum Pontificum is not going to be something you will uh, rejoice about. Well, and, and, yeah. and I think you, you make a, a really good point that, that it's so true that so many Novus or, or, or so many of your traditionalists are run by emotions and by, by what they see and what they smell and what they hear. And, and there's something to that. But I, I had a conversation yesterday with a young man from France who recently became a state of a contest. And, and he was telling me, you know, he was he, he came from nothing. He came from no faith whatsoever and just kind of step by step found it. And he said what really helped him find it after all of the you know kind of craziness that goes on you know you're reading what's going on in social media or, or whatever he he just said okay you know what i'm just going to go read vatican one so he read the vatican one documents and then he read the vatican two documents and he said after that it was so it was so clear that yeah. he said he said it was so clear he, there was no other option and that's yeah. an awesome thing and this is a young guy i think 23 24 years old and yeah. he just came to that conclusion he took the emotions out of it he didn't say oh this is nice. This is comfortable. This is beautiful. He said, no, what is the church? And that's pretty cool. And, and that's, again, what I think we want to talk about. It's This is not a show to try to just lambaste somebody who just died. The point is, he is seen in a light that is dangerous. You, you have conservatives, you know, whoever, going out there and saying he should be canonized. This isn't mm -hmm. your Nova Soto. This is really people that I, I, I think they're even part of the SSPX oftentimes. And that's pretty yes. extreme. Yes. Yes, and it is dangerous is the right word. Um, yes, we, you know, you obviously, you know, when especially when somebody has just died, you, you know, you realize the seriousness of it all, and you, you always, you know, pray and hope for the best. You know, obviously, we we pray that he, you know, converted before before he died. We pray that he died in the state of sanctifying grace. We don't want him to be in hell. Uh, but uh, it, it, it changes nothing of the damage he has done, uh, especially since uh, the, the council, and, and, and especially as the so-called, you got to remember, for uh, uh, roughly 25 years, he was the, oh, excuse me, 20, was it 23 years, he was the prefect of the so-called Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. Um, in other words, he was, uh, his job supposedly uh, had been to guard Catholic orthodoxy throughout the entire church. And, um, I mean, you know, I won't, I was going to say, you know, if there's one man who shouldn't be in charge of that, it'd be Joseph Ratzinger, but there's, of course, plenty of others that shouldn't. Um, 
But uh, I, yeah, so I think, uh, as you said, the uh, reason why he is often uh, considered conservative is for one thing because of his Benedict the Sixteenth, um, so-called papacy. You know, he 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 bent over backwards to be nice to traditionalists, right? He lifted the SSPX excommunications. He used beautiful vestments. He you know he brought back uh, a decent crozier or oh, fair rule, I should say, you know, the, the pastoral staff and, uh, and so on. But, uh, and, and then of course, there's also the fact that with Vatican II, which Ratzinger did have, uh, you know, significant influence at, uh, with Vatican II, um, even though he himself was a progressivist and, you know, a liberal, uh, nevertheless, there were so many others that were so far more extreme than he was that he actually appeared conservative by comparison, right? And uh, that is so basically, he didn't want to go as far uh, or as crazy as some of these others, like Schillebeeks and and um, who else am I thinking of? Hans Kung, of course, right? Uh, and so that he was, and I think the media also had a lot to do with it. He was painted as the the, the conservative uh, counterpart to them. But it was simply, if you're judging it by Catholic standards, by Catholic orthodoxy, in no way was Joseph Ratzinger a conservative. So, but he did have that veneer. Also, you know, he's got a certain, uh, you know, displayed a certain piety, and and you know, he's just certainly the externals uh, look good as as far as uh, that goes, especially when you compared now to Bergoglio, right? Who who just comes in there, he's like a bull in a china shop, right? And doesn't care. Um, but it, it can't be our standard. Like we can't judge these things by sentimentalism. We can't judge them by, um, you know, the standards of the world. We can't judge them by the standards of the modern media. Uh, sure, I mean, that you know, anyone, for example, who is, uh, you know, against abortion and anyone who is, uh, you know, against contraception, at least uh, in, in, in theory, uh, is going to be painted as a radical conservative, right? And so, uh, but no, when you actually look at the, the record at the real Ratzinger, you get quite a different picture. Again, if you judge it by the pre-Vatican to Catholic standards. And um, in, in fact, in 19, so he was ordained a priest in 1951, and uh, the way it worked in Germany is uh, you had to, if, if you wanted to teach theology at a university, and of course that was always what he wanted, right, Professor Ratzinger, um, not only did you have to have a doctorate, uh, as you probably do in most universities uh, in the Western world, but you also had to have um, a second, you had to have basically a doctorate and then a second, uh, you had to write a second dissertation and defend that, and that would then allow you to teach. And uh, that is what Ratzinger did. He submitted his second dissertation, I think it was 1956, so still under Pius XII, and the second dissertation, and this was at, I um, believe, the University of Munich, um, so this was not a seminary, but it's a little more Germany is a bit different uh, from how it is here in the United States. You could uh, study Catholic theology as a candidate for the priesthood at university, as far as I'm aware, at least at certain universities. Um, in any case, Ratzinger submitted his second dissertation in 1956, and one of the professors who was evaluating the dissertation rejected it. And he, he this was uh, on St. Bonaventure, and uh, I believe it was on the um, the subject of revelation in the thought of St. Bonaventure, if I'm not mistaken. In any case, the um, professor who rejected the thesis was Father Michael Schmaus. It's S-C-H-M-A-U-S, -S -S, Father Michael Schmaus. And he rejected it because he recognized in it a, quote, dangerous modernism. Uh, that was uh, the the reason for it. He also said he that he misrepresented the thought of uh, Saint Bonaventure, and that is what. Uh, in, in fact, this is so. This is not even a secret or anything. You can see, uh, you can find this 
Uh, let me see. Maybe we can provide a link to it in the uh, in the notes for the show. Um, but it says here, let me see what I'm quoting from. So this is from the September 12th, 2009 issue of The Tablet, which is, a, I think, a British periodical. Uh, it's progressivist, so this is by no means uh, real Catholic or anything. But back in 2012, you see, uh, Ratzinger's collected works were being published, and um, I think they're still being published. There's just so much that they they publish it step by step. Um, and it uh, so they actually released his original dissertation, the one you know, as part of his collected works um, in back in 2012. And um, so this includes the the dissertation that was rejected. And that's why that uh, came up in, in the press again. And it says here, uh, this is from a little blurb of, uh, from that issue of the tablet. It's entitled, Pope's Rejected Thesis Published. And let me just quote from this here real quick. Quote, Professor Michael Schmaus of the University of Munich, the second assessor to look at Ratzinger's submission, objected to Ratzinger's analysis of St. Bonaventure's doctrine of revelation which Ratzinger argued was based on scripture and tradition together rather than just scripture. Schmaus accused Ratzinger of dangerous modernism and of misinterpreting Bonaventure's thinking. The treatise was given back to Ratzinger to correct, whereupon he expanded a section on Bonaventure's theology of history to produce the version that was later accepted. Uh, in Milestones, that's Ratzinger's memoirs, in Milestones, the second volume of his memoirs, Joseph Ratzinger calls the episode a, quote, nightmare, unquote. So um, this is by no means some sort of secret, or nor is it, um, nor is it some, some, some conspiracy theory or something thought of by Sedevacantus. This is actually included even in Ratzinger's memoirs, that his second dissertation was rejected for modernism. And I think that is the reason, uh, I think Schmaus reported Ratzinger, this is, I, I know somebody did, Ratzinger uh, has apparently been tagged suspect, at that time in the 50s, was tagged suspect of heresy by the Holy Office. And I think the reason is that dissertation, I think Schmaus probably, um, uh, probably uh, reported him to the Holy Office. Wow. And... Uh, so yeah, th this is uh, so this is Joseph Ratzinger early on. He's been a priest for roughly five years at that point, and he's you know flirting with modernism, or uh, maybe not even just flirting with it. But uh, the way this eventually worked out is that uh, Ratzinger, you know, he was supposed to correct his treatise, right? Which he didn't really do. What he did was he looked at where most of the markups were from from uh, Father Schmaus, right? Uh, and decided that he was just going to trash all that and just submit the last part of the thesis, which there wasn't that much, uh, th that many corrections. And uh, and I guess he just kind of elaborated on that and submitted that then uh, as the dissertation, and uh, that was then accepted. But now the whole thing has been published in Ratzinger's collected works. Uh, so that is uh, so that is like the first indicator that joseph ratzinger is trouble and uh, unfortunately it went downhill from there and then of course came the council and he uh, attended vatican II as the theological expert or uh, advisor to cardinal frings who was the archbishop of cologne so every bishop uh, of course, all bishops in the world were invited to the council, and every bishop got to bring with him uh, a theological expert, a theological uh, advisor, and uh, Frings chose Ratzinger. And that's how Ratzinger got into the council. And so, uh, unfortunately, we find uh, in a lot of Ratzinger's writings, you know, there's, there's just problems all over. And one of the things uh, you notice right away is that ja Ratzinger makes what is clear obscure, okay? He obfuscates. In the end, you just have no idea anymore what he's actually saying or what you're reading. And you ask yourself, why does it have to be that way? And I'll give you a good example in a minute. Uh, it, let me just briefly note that those people who say, oh, but look, Ratzinger did all these wonderful things, right? Benedict gave us this, he gave us that, he changed, like he 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 put back the, um, you know, the, 
uh, for you and for many into the mass rather than for you and for all. He did all these things. Well, that may all be true, but in order to evaluate somebody, somebody's orthodoxy, whether he is good for, for Catholicism or a danger to Catholicism, you have to look at both sides of the ledger. You can't just look at all the quote unquote good stuff that you think he did and ignore the rest. And so, uh, in other words, don't just look at some more pontificum or what you think was good about it. Uh, also look at what else he did, especially with regard to ecumenism and interreligious dialogue. Okay. Well, it, 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 I'm sorry, real quick. It makes you wonder about, you know, how they, you see all these Vatican II, quote unquote, popes are all, of course, saints now. And it yeah. just makes you wonder <laughs> who, who on earth was, was the devil's advocate for this? I mean, I mean, what, what, as you say, what are they looking at? You know, what, what are they what are the points that are going to make someone a saint? And again, so you know Ratzinger is going to be a saint. Of course he has to be because he is involved oh, yeah. in Vatican II. So Vatican II makes you automatically a saint and, of, of course, not a real one. Everyone At, at least if you're, the, if, if you're the Pope. In quotes, right, right, exactly. Right, right. right. Oh, because yeah. your connection to that must, it must sanctify, I suppose, Vatican II. That, that has to be the law. Nothing right. but immense holiness on the chair of St. Peter since Pius XII died, right? Of course. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. It's so obvious, right? Yeah. No, it's it's all falling apart. And you can, uh, I think, pretty much uh, trace it back to this new theology uh, that Ratzinger uh, was a big proponent of, the Nouvelle Theologie, which was uh, taking, uh, uh, taking hold in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. And Pius XII wrote against it. And according to recently uncovered documents in the Vatican secret archives that they've now opened, Pius XII was actually planning to write another encyclical against modern errors. And um, unfortunately, he died before he could publish it. And, um, well, we, we know what, you know, the rest is history, as they say. So, um, yeah, you know what, let me give you, uh, if we have a little bit of time, I want to give you a great example of what Ratzinger does to Catholic doctrine and dogma with regard to original sin. Okay. okay? Now, uh, all of us uh, who are listening, if we're traditional Catholics, we know from our catechism, you know, what original sin is. Um, and, you know, we can all pretty much give a fairly... Uh, uh, succinct, uh, you know, definition uh, about it being, you know, the uh, the sin committed by Adam and Eve uh, in the Garden of Eden that uh, was passed on to posterity through generation, and it consists in um, above all the loss of sanctifying grace in the soul, you know, and has effects such as concupiscence, so that we are, you know, inclined to sin uh, from now on. You know, then there is pain and childbirth for women, and uh, there just a number of consequences. But essentially, it's the loss of sanctifying grace in the soul, and um, it uh, has been passed down from Adam on uh, to the rest of humanity, and that's why every child must be baptized, and, and of course every adult too, but beginning even with little children, because we are no longer born, uh, we are not born in the state of sanctifying grace. The Blessed Mother was an exception, of course, since she was conceived immaculately uh, by, by a miraculous intervention by our Lord. But all of us are afflicted with this original sin from conception on. And this can be remedied. First of all, the state of sanctifying grace is restored through the sacrament of baptism. Right when faith, hope, and charity are infused into the soul, since these had been lost, uh, and uh, then also as far as the effects of original sin, this is what we have to remedy by means of penance and mortification, and so forth. Um, so th that's and and this is a very uh, spontaneous. It's a good one <laughs> definition, if you yeah, will. Good I apologize if I if I left something out or you know if it's not super clear, but I'm not. I'm just really saying this off the cuff. In any case, so this more or less right is what we all understand about original sin. Now, uh, it is a deprivation of grace from the soul uh, when uh, human beings are conceived, and uh, well, that's not what it is for Joseph Ratzinger. Okay, if you want to hear. What Joseph Ratzinger says about original sin, uh, I suggest you turn to 
Uh, this is from uh, a book called In the Beginning, A Catholic Understanding of uh, the Story of Creation and the Fall. Now, just for some background here, the English translation was published in 1995, but that book is actually simply a collection of Lenten sermons that Joseph Ratzinger gave when he was uh, supposedly the Archbishop of Munich in uh, during Lent of 1981, okay? So in other words, this is not some, uh, the, he's not writing this in some theological periodical where other experts in theology are, um, you know, reading this. This is what he tells basically his, his flock during a Lenten sermon. In other words, the, the average Joe is sitting in the pew and listening to this, okay? Uh, keep that in mind as you read what he says here. And uh, for those who want to uh, verify this, this is from uh, this is from pages seventy one through seventy three. Oh, excuse me. Uh, yes, seventy one through seventy three uh, of in the beginning, a Catholic understanding of the story of creation and the fall. Here's what he says about original sin. Quote. In the Genesis story that we are considering, still a further characteristic of sin is described. Sin is not spoken of in general as an abstract possibility, but as a deed, as the sin of a particular person, Adam, who stands at the origin of humankind and with whom the history of sin begins. The account tells us that sin begets sin and that therefore all the sins of history are interlinked. Theology refers to this state of affairs by the certainly misleading and imprecise term original sin. What does this mean? Nothing seems to us today to be stranger or indeed more absurd than to insist upon original sin, since according to our way of thinking, guilt can only be something very personal. And since God does not run a concentration camp in which one's relatives are imprisoned because he is a liberating God of love who calls each one by name. What does original sin mean then when we interpret it correctly? Finding an answer to this requires nothing less than trying to understand the human person better. It must once again be stressed that no human being is closed in upon himself and that no one can live of or for himself alone. We receive our life not only at the moment of birth, but every day from without, from others who are not ourselves, but who nonetheless somehow pertain to us. Human beings have their selves not only in themselves, but also outside of themselves. They live in those whom they love and in those who love them and to whom they are present. Human beings are relational, and they possess their lives, themselves, only by way of relationship. I alone am not myself, but only in and with you am I myself. To be truly a human being means to be related in love, to be of and for. But sin means the damaging or the destruction of relationality. Sin is a rejection of relationality because it wants to make the human being a god. Sin is loss of relationship, disturbance of relationship, and therefore it is not restricted to the individual. When I destroy a relationship, then this event, sin, touches the other person involved in the relationship. Consequently, sin is always an offense that touches others that alters the world and damages it. To the extent that this is true, when the network of human relationships is damaged from the very beginning, then every human being enters into a world that is marked by relational damage. At the very moment that a person begins human existence, which is a good, he or she is confronted by a sin-damaged world. Each of us enters into a situation in which relationality has been hurt. Consequently, each person is, from the very start, damaged in relationships and does not engage in them as he ought. Sin pursues the human being, and he, capit and he capitulates to it, unquote. Kevin, please summarize. Just kidding. Yeah, that's, uh, wow. That, that is some I mean, yeah, I, I, was, I was having to laugh halfway through. <laughs> like, wait, oh, it, it, it is insane. Now, um... It, it, on Novus Ordo, I watch, there's a whole page on this particular original sin thing. Maybe we can uh, uh, link to that. Definitely. But it, it is essentially for him, notice, first of all, that at no point does he mention the soul. 
okay right there's nothing in there about soul there's nothing in there about sanctifying grace do, do you remember hearing anything about grace no um nor now he does say sin begets sin but that's too vague uh it's not so much that sin begets it's it's the it's generation of offspring that transmits um the the uh fault of adam right the original sin uh to it's it's kind of like i think theologians like to um liken it to uh like a lost inheritance right mm -hmm. if uh your great grandfather squandered his inheritance well guess what you're not going to get it either right. right you might say well that's not my fault that's right but you still don't have it right. i mean it's not owed to you and um, so it's not enough to say, oh, sin begets sin. And that, that is uh, right there what, uh, that's an affirmation of the Orthodox doctrine. It's not. Um, and the Council of Trent has quite a few anathemas regarding uh, original sin. And um, I, I mean, it, it says right there, for example, if anyone does not confess that the first man, Adam, when he had transgressed the commandment of God in paradise, immediately lost his holiness and the justice in which he had been established, and that he incurred through the offense of that prevarication the wrath and indignation of God, and hence the death with which God had previously threatened him, and death captivity under his power, who thenceforth had the empire of death, that is, of the devil, and that through that offense of prevarication, the entire Adam was transformed in body and soul for the worse, led him to anathema. Uh, that's that's one of the anathemas. And, and then the same council, Council of Trent says, if anyone asserts that the transgression of Adam has harmed him alone and not his posterity, and that the sanctity and justice received from God, which he lost, he has lost for himself alone and not for us also, or that he, having been defiled by the sin of disobedience, has transfused only death and the punishments of the body into the whole human race, but not sin also, which is the death of the soul, let him be anathema, since he contradicts the apostle, says by one man sin entered into the world, and by sin death, and so death passed upon all men in whom all have sinned. Um, and there's a number of other anathemas regarding original sin. So the problem here is that for, for Joseph Ratzinger, original sin is not a deprivation of, sanctify, of sanctifying grace in human souls transmitted by natural generation. For him, original sin is a damage in human relationships encountered by every human being. Okay? If we want to uh, sum up what he said there about... Um, you know, all this stuff about how human beings are whatever, in themselves and of themselves and all that stuff. Um, so, it, it, but what Ratzinger says is simply wrong because that is not what original sin is. Now, there's no question that on account of original sin, there is a damage in relationships. That's true. That's a consequence of original sin, uh, maybe, right? But it is not that in which original sin essentially consists. It was... Pius the eleventh. Uh, let me see if I can find this real quick. Uh, who wrote? Oh, and this is a quote from the encyclical Brennender Sorge. Right, this was written in German. Mit Brennender Sorge. Um, original sin this is a quote. Original sin is the hereditary but impersonal fault of Adam's descendants who have sinned in him. It is the loss of grace and therefore of eternal life together with a propensity to evil which everybody must, with the assistance of grace, penance, resistance, and moral effort, repress and conquer. The passion and death of the Son of God has redeemed the world from the hereditary curse of sin and death. Faith in these truths uh, belong to the inalienable treasury of Christian revelation, unquote. That's 25 of that encyclical. So um, there's nothing Ratzinger about the loss of grace. There's nothing in there about the soul. There's nothing in there about eternal life that I recall, um, uh, nor about, uh, uh, you know, yeah, I already mentioned grace and nothing about penance or uh, mortification. It is, it is just something, it's just gobbledygook about relationships and uh, human existence and we're all, you know, confronted by a sin-damaged world. Okay, well, Besides, he also doesn't mention conception, right? He only mentions, uh, I believe it was birth. 
Well, he's actually, no, not true. He says at the very moment that a person begins human existence, he is confronted by a sin damaged world. Okay. So you could probably say um, that that means conception, the, you know, the first moment of existence. Um, but you can see it is certainly not clear. It is, it is a complete mess. And I only feel sorry for the people who were sitting in the cathedral in Munich on that day in 1981 and had to listen to this. Well, and, and I, I, I get the impression that people it, it's, and, and you see it with Bergoglio too, maybe not as, as nicely as Ratzinger, but, but he, he dresses things up in a way that, that it seems like it could be really smart. You know, it's like, like he, he just throws, it's, it's like word salad, you know, he throws these things together and, and then, and, and it, you, at least like his English Twitter, at least I see it all the time. I think you, you, you publish or you comment on it a lot. On, on Twitter. And it's just like, it's pretty shocking because you can see kind of how people would be like, Oh, that seems pretty deep. Wow. You know, mm -hmm. th this guy's got some real depth, but I mean, you, you look into it for two minutes and it's like, yeah. wait, what? <laughs> he's not saying anything. He, he's just, he's throwing words together, you know, whatever it is. And, and it almost never has to do with God. It almost never has to do with sin or the soul. It's always has to do with, with humanity, you know, and, and, human issues which is which is i guess again it's kind of going off topic but but it, it's it's just i think you see people are so blinded by you know i bet you ratzinger had a great vestment i bet he had great vestments that day you know i bet, there, <laughs> I, bet I bet there's incense and so the the, the sermon was kind of like oh that's that's nice you know next and, yeah. and i think and i'm sure you would agree with me mario that 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 is maybe the greatest issue of our age is that people are are totally 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 100 in for the latin mass and they're about one percent in for the catechism mm -hmm. yeah i mean i i think you're talking about indult people right 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 uh yeah i mean certainly they all want traditional catechism um you know but they uh, are willing well see i guess <sighs> I don't know. It, it's a little bit difficult, I, I think, to say generally because it always, I think, depends on the individual family uh, or the, the just the individual person who attends the adult. I, I mean, I think there are some that would be okay with teaching their children the Vatican II catechism. There are others that would never do that. Um, and so it becomes, it is, you know, even the adult, there's a lot of, you know, recognize and resist there. Um, I mean, I, you know, I, for a short time in my life, I was uh, affiliated with the adult uh, movement and I went there and um, certainly, you know, you kind of do your own thing. Uh, you, you go to mass to the adult and then you use whatever catechism you want. And if it says somewhere in a document coming from the Vatican that you need to accept Vatican II in order to uh, go to adult mass, then you just don't care. But shouldn't but shouldn't your catechism? I mean, shouldn't it tell you that hey, you have to listen to to what the Pope says? I mean, there, there is an authority in the church that you're not allowed to disobey. Now, I, I understand. I, I, I'm probably yeah. coming off as an as a, as an arrogant jerk. I am a cradle sede, so I, I don't I, I don't understand that perspective. So I, I fully admit that. But but I mean, isn't that something? I mean, if people, I mean, if you really understood the catechism and what the church is, then it, it, I think recognize and resist just doesn't make any sense. Yeah, uh, that's true. It doesn't. Once you understand the Catholic teaching about the papacy and the church, and you know, as the harbor of salvation and the beacon of truth and holiness, uh, you, you, you then of course these things no longer make sense. Um, uh, but uh, at least you know myself at that point in my life, I didn't realize all. That. I didn't know all that, and uh, you always kind of look at well, what's the alternative anyway? Obviously, I can't get, go along with. Uh, you know, Vatican II religion, which is true. You can't go along with it. This, all this stuff didn't fall into place for me until later. So uh, I don't know. I think, you know, for a lot of people are pro probably just struggling to make it all work and to figure it all out. And they're trying to raise children in the, in the, at the same time. And it's all very confusing and it, it can be really tough. And so, um, so I guess they don't, oftentimes they, they just don't, like you were saying earlier, it's more of a, I don't want to say emotion-based. Uh, these are not emotion-based decisions necessarily, but I think a lot of it has to do with what is pragmatic, what, you know, what, what, what will actually work uh, for them.
and uh, not so much, well, what what is the actual theology uh, behind it? And does, you know, can we say that? And, and so on. That, that's, that would be my, my guess. But, um, you know, with, with Ratzinger, so we already hinted at, or we already talked about, you know, what happened back in 1956 with his second dissertation. Uh, there are other indicators that it's not just us who are making a big fuss about Joseph Ratzinger. And then we're all, you know, as if we were the only ones. Um, for example, during Vatican II, th this is interesting. Now, this is an anecdote, so this is not um, something you can really verify, I don't think, unless maybe somebody can dig up a historical resource. But, I mean, here is a testimony. In, in, in 2011, uh, uh, I think that is when, uh, let's see. Uh, oh, one of Karl Rahner's... Uh, his younger sister, Elizabeth, um, uh, she was in possession of uh, a number of letters uh, that she, from her brother that, uh, you know, family letters and stuff that she turned over to the Karl Rahner archive. And for those who don't know who Karl Rahner was, he was a huge theologian, uh, no, no less, um, I would say, perhaps even a bit more um, prestigious and uh, a little more celebrated even than Joseph Ratzinger, at least until uh, he died, which was 1984. But he was uh, a big mover and shaker at Vatican II. And he, um, so he wrote a letter to his brother, Hugo, on November 2nd, 1963. And this letter was discovered in 2011 uh, and, and it came through his uh, through Karl Rahner's younger sister. So I just want to give a little bit of background as to why all of a sudden there is a letter now that we know about that was written in 1963 that we never heard about before 2011. Um, so in that letter, Karl Rahner mentions, and unfortunately, I don't have uh, the, the, I don't have a copy of the letter, but what I do have is access to an article that appears in a German theological periodical that quotes from the letter and, and mentions the letter and describes the contents. And so Karl Rahner wrote to his brother Hugo that there were conservative French bishops who accused Joseph Ratzinger of being a, quote, heretic who denies hell, unquote. That's not evidence for anything other than the evidence of the historical testimony. I just want to point this out uh, as as um, documentation of the fact that uh, there were problems with Ratzinger early on, right? And they're quite independent of Sedevacantism and so on. It's not just us who are trying to, oh, you know, find fault with Ratzinger. This, this is part of the historical record. And um, our position on Ratzinger, our opinions of the man are based in historical fact. And so there's something... Uh, there to support that. Um, then we I mentioned earlier the collected works of Ratzinger that are that have been published for the last uh, at least 10 years. And there was an article uh, in 1972 uh, that was published by Ratzinger in which he argued this was um, the, the article was entitled on the question of the indissolubility of marriage. And um, he argues in there, to make a long story short, that in some cases, those who live in an adulterous relationship after divorce could be admitted to the sacraments, right, Holy Communion and Confession, without repenting uh, of their adultery. And so, in other words, it's Amoris Laetitia a few decades prior. Now, when it came time to republish that essay, since it's part of the collected works of Ratzinger, what happened is that Ratzinger, uh, and this was, I believe, in 2014 when this was republished, um, Ratzinger retracted Benedict the Sixteenth at that point, right, the so-called Pope Emeritus. He retracted the uh, conclusion that uh, people that uh, uh, some adulterers should be permitted to receive Holy Communion. But he did not retract the argumentation that leads to the conclusion. So in other words, the essay was republished, except now he said, no, they're not allowed. Okay, so it's, it's a mess, right? Um, they, they, he should have just said, no, you know what, this was wrong, we're going to scrap it. And in 
instead you get the sort of, well, we'll publish it, but I disagree with the conclusion. Right. So just a, a bizarre. So there's another thing of Ratzinger being troubled. As another example, this was in 1972, so much for being the great uh, conservative. Uh, then in 2014, um, uh, an interesting anecdote uh, came out. Um, a lady by the name of Sigrid Spat, Sigrid Spath, I guess, if we Americanize it. Um, on February 2nd, 2014, Sigrid Spath passed away in Rome. She was Austrian by birth and had worked for the Vatican as a translator of official church documents since the time of Paul VI. And Vatican Radio uh, released an article on her life and work, and uh, which is very interesting because Sigrid Spath was actually a Lutheran. Uh, however, <coughs> excuse me, However, the interesting part about this is that she had been advised not to convert to Catholicism by Joseph Ratzinger. Whoa. And here's what, um, what Vatican Radio said, courtesy of, uh, let's see, this is a translation from Rorate Celi. It says, as prefect of the congregation Doctrine of the Faith, Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger charged her personally with a German version of particularly sensitive documents, such as his response to the objections of Protestant theologians to the Joint Declaration on the Doctrine of Justification of 1999. It was also Cardinal Ratzinger who, according to her own testimony, advised Sigrid Spath to remain a Protestant and not to convert to the Catholic Church as she had considered in a moment of crisis. She could do more for both churches if she remained a Protestant, said Cardinal. Whoa. Uh, unquote. And so, so she died a Protestant because of Joseph Ratzinger. So this is this is not some state of a kind of source. This is Vatican Radio, okay, saying this. So once again, you have, this is the real Joseph Ratzinger. And like I said earlier, you have to take into consideration everything about him. Not just like on your bank statement, you can't just look at the plus ledger, uh, the plus mm -hmm. side of the ledger, and not at the negative side, right? I wish. Um, so yeah. So it's 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 a complete distortion to say, oh, now no, look, he did you know some more on pontificum and 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 this and that, and and he really didn't like communion in the hand. Well. Yeah, actually, he, well, you know, what we can go by is what he did, what he did and what he said. And then the rest is conjecture, right? And speaking of communion in the hand or communion in general, it was Joseph Ratzinger who administered Holy Communion or the Novus Ordo equivalent to Holy Communion to a public Protestant in St. Peter's Square in public, okay? This was I uh, believe it was April 8th, 2005, the funeral of John Paul II, a huge event. Joseph Ratzinger prominently gives a Novus Sordo communion to brother Roger Schutz, uh, a Swiss leader and founder of the Taizé movement, uh, which is an ecumenical movement, heretical, of course, in, uh, in the south of France. And uh, of course, you know, Ratzinger knew exactly who he was, and uh, he gave him communion, even though the man was not even claiming to be a Catholic. And the interesting part is that Ratzinger is actually permitted to do that according to Novus Ordo Canon Law. Okay, you can look it up. It's Canon 844, uh, number four. You will see that uh, certain uh, there are, there are certain circumstances under which Protestants can receive communion even without first converting to Catholicism. Now, that is even worse than giving communion to Catholic adulterers. Right. So it, it's insane. Let me give you one, one other uh, little tidbit uh, that I found. This, this is another one of those, like, you can't make this stuff up. This is from an article of August 12th, 2005, by John Allen. Okay? And this is for the... the uh, horrible uh, national catholic reporter so-called okay certainly not a conservative publication this is a liberal uber modernist uh uh you know pseudo-catholic uh newspaper 
and they're still in existence. And I mean, even the like they're officially even the official Novus Ordo Church does not recognize them as Catholic. Anyway, John, but John Allen is a credible journalist. As a journalist, he does jo good journalistic work. He's just not a Catholic, and he writes the following uh, quote. As a German theologian and convinced Augustinian, Joseph Ratzinger has long admired the Protestant reformer Martin Luther. In 1965, commenting on the document Gaudium et Spes from the final session of the Second Vatican Council, Ratzinger criticized the text for relying too much on the optimism of French Jesuit Teilhard de Chardin and not enough on Luther's consciousness of the cross and of sin unquote. Okay. So in other words, Joseph Ratzinger is complaining there's not enough of Martin Luther in a Catholic document. You can't make the Crazy. stuff up. Crazy. Well, and, and it's like, it, it always strikes me too, that, that again, he's known for being better dressed investments, etc. But, but you see just as many pictures of him, <clears throat> excuse me, embracing African tribes or Africans painting stuff on him and Indians and and in you know hugging Protestants and in, in the Orthodox, and yeah. he was just as as falsely ecumenical as as anybody. And and again, yes. as, as you've said several times, it's just flatly ignored. People just it's like cognitive yeah. dissonance. It's just close your eyes. Nope, that didn't happen. It's like well, guys, there's proof. And Mario has just spent forty five minutes telling us exactly what the proof is. And I, I think that that's and I, I hope you know people listening to this that the, again the point of the show is not to throw dirt on the on, on someone who just died. The point is to say, hey, this is who he really was. You know, open your eyes, realize yes, this, yes. and make your Very own important. conclusions. Yes, right. because right now, you know, there's a lot of sentimentalism going on and stuff. And, uh, well, he's like, you should be praying for him instead of... Well, you know what? You can do both. You can pray for somebody and still expose his, his heresies and how much damage he did to the Catholic faith. And uh, yeah, you, you see people celebrating Ratzinger and and all that uh, at the same time are criticizing Vatican II. Well, <laughs> Ratzinger was not just a man of Vatican II, but he was he was the guardian of Vatican II orthodoxy, right? For 25 years or however many was two years under John Paul II. The, the Novus Ordo Catechism comes from Joseph Ratzinger. Of course, he was not the only one writing it, but he was the one overseeing the whole project. And you'd better believe it's, you know, all Ratzinger endorsed. And in fact, he was the one giving it the imprimatur. Um, and, you know, let me just, I know uh, we're already a little long here, but um, I, I, let me just mention a few more things regarding, for example, this brother Roger Schutz that he gave Noble's Order Communion to in uh, 2005. <clears throat> Well, Roger Schutz, he was actually murdered uh, later on. I believe it was the same year. I think it was in August. Um, and uh, in any case, so of course, it's, it's tragic. It's horrible that the man was, was murdered. And uh, however, that still doesn't entitle you to, um, you know, commit heresy or blasphemy or any of these things. Well, what did Ratzinger say? Um uh, let me quote this. This is from Zenit. Yeah. And so this is dated August 17th, 2005. So actually just a few weeks after he received Novel Sort of Communion from Ratzinger, he was murdered. Wow. And at this moment of sadness, this is a quote now from Benedict the 16th. We can only commend to the Lord's goodness the soul of this faithful servant of his. Okay. Um, first of all, it, okay, you can commend to the Lord, yes, the soul of, of anyone really. Right, I think, um, but he calls him a faithful servant of his. A Protestant, yeah. Uh, he, he he was a Protestant who founded an ecumenical, uh, heretical ecumenical movement or group, and it, it's true. Now we're we're not saying you can judge his soul that God does that, but you cannot call him a faithful servant of his. You you cannot do that. He was a Protestant minister. You can say whatever. He was maybe confused. Maybe he meant well. Maybe he. Maybe he, uh, you know, converted before his, he can say all of these things, but you, but you cannot say that he was a faithful servant. Like objectively, that is false, uh, right? And then Ratzinger, uh, Benedict the Sixteenth adds, Brother Schutz, or here in the text here it's called Frere Schutz because that's French for brother. 
Freyr Schutz is in the hands of eternal goodness, of eternal love. He has attained eternal joy. Unquote. Wow. Okay, so is, is this an instant canonization right there? And, and it, look, look this, this makes no sense. He just said we can only commend him to the Lord's goodness. And now he says he has attained eternal joy. Well, if he has attained eternal joy, why do you need to commend him to the Lord's goodness? Right. <laughs> right. I mean, it, it makes no sense. Right. And uh, but th this is that's the, the Novus Ordo religion for you. They do this all the time. Right. And, um, you know, people I don't know if they don't notice it or what, but you, you go to a Novus Ordo funeral, not that you should. But if you do, you find out that essentially it's a canonization ceremony, especially the eulogies and stuff. Right. And so they're all talking about how the person is now in heaven. And then somebody, or then at some part of the ritual or whatever, prayers are offered for the repose of his soul. And it's like, well, which is it? Why do we need to offer prayers for somebody who's already in heaven? And conversely, why do we say he's in heaven if we're praying for him still? So it makes no sense. Uh, but I, I, I don't know. I guess people, most people either don't notice it or they just don't, they just Maybe they do notice it, but they kind of shrug and say, yeah, whatever, you know. Um, so Joseph Ratzinger has done immense damage to souls, and few people have had more influence or as much influence as he has had on souls and in terms of shaping Novus Ordo doctrine. And uh, there is so much we could talk about, how he undermines and denies the, the bodily resurrection of Christ. And and the, and the resurrection, the the, the um, nature of uh, the resurrection of of uh, bodies at the end of the world. Um, we can talk, for example, about um, here. You want to hear him deny an actual dogma of Vatican One. You know, Vatican One find the primacy of jurisdiction of the Pope that that has an anathema attached to it. If you deny that primacy, not just of honor of the Pope. I, I, kind of like a first among equals, but a primacy of jurisdiction, right? He's the supreme governor of the church and teacher of the church. Excuse me. <coughs> and um, Joseph Ranzinger writes this in the book Principles of Catholic Theology, uh, published in English in 1987. The German original was published in 1982, just as he was getting started in the Vatican as prefect for the destruction of the faith. Um, it says, so he writes here, and you can look this up. Uh, this is, I believe this is page 217. He talks about, you know, ecumenical relations with Eastern Orthodox. And, and of course, the issue of papal primacy comes up and the Eastern Orthodox deny the Vatican I dogma of the primacy of jurisdiction. And Ratzinger says, it would be worth our while to consider whether this archaic confession, and he, here he's referring to, I believe it was uh, the, uh, what is this now, a confession of um, uh, some Eastern Orthodox patriarch, um, whether this confession, which has nothing to do with the primacy of jurisdiction, but confesses a primacy of honor and agape, love, might not be recognized as a formula that adequate that adequately reflects the position Rome occupies in the church. Unquote. In other words, he's saying, well, it might be worth a while to consider if Vatican I actually, if the Vatican I dogma of the primacy of jurisdiction is false. That's that that's what you can you can look this up. You can you can get the book. Um or we can put a link uh, to the, even a scan of the pages. So you can read it in context, right? Because very often, you know, but, oh, you're taking it out of context and there's bad translation. No, we, can, we have it in German too. Um, so it, it's the, the evidence is there. The question is, why is this man being considered a great conservative and traditionalist? And, you know, and then sometimes people will, uh, will say, well, you know, I believe that as Benedict XVI, Ratzinger really tried to reverse all this. There is no evidence for that. Not if you if you look at everything he did. It's it's simply a dream. 
it's a pipe dream that some people have chosen to fool themselves with. But, uh, I mean, it was Joseph Ratzinger who, uh, you know, prayed in a mosque, right, with uh, uh, the, the imam. Now, he didn't, like, they didn't have vocal prayer together, not in that kind of way, but he was there standing next to the imam. The imam was offering prayers, and Ratzinger was standing there next to him with his eyes closed. And, um, you know, at least externally, it looks like he's praying. Um, if it, certainly the Vatican did not say that he did not pray, they didn't say that he prayed either. They just said something like, um, uh, what was it? Uh, he, he, he paused or whatever. Uh, but it, the picture says it all, right? You have the Imam and Ratzinger, Ratzinger as Benedict the 16th standing there and in what appears to be prayer. And, uh, so, and of course, you know, if you remember the Assisi gathering in 196, uh, excuse me. 1986 for, of John Paul II, when Ratzinger was prefect of the congregation, right, for the destruction of the faith. Um, that back then, and also then John Paul, of course, repeated it in 2002. This was the interreligious prayer for peace meeting with all the, you know, every pagan under the sun showing up, and they they got to offer their pr prayers to their gods. They even uh, let, the, they, they allowed them to uh, pray and do their uh perform their rituals inside, I think it was a Catholic monastery where they provided them with rooms, took off the crucifixes, and, and you know, and then here's the voodoo guy doing his thing, and then there's the Zoroastrian doing what he does, and it was disgusting. Um, so people then, oh yeah, but you, did you hear, you know, Ratzinger disagreed with that, and and then once Ratzinger is Benedict the Sixteenth, he does the same thing. Right. So uh, a lot of these things, I think, I, they're just myths. Um, and so I would just say, people, don't go by conjecture. Don't come up with some sort of, you know, private opinion about what you think may have been going on inside Ratzinger's mind. It's irrelevant. You have to go by the objective facts. Here's what he did. Here's what he said. And so... I think when we do that, when we approach Ratzinger that way, you can see right away that that man was not a Catholic. He did not do anything good for souls in the end um, when all is said and done. Of course, I'm sure there were individual things that if taken you know, individually, if you look at him individually, he say, oh, this was good. So, for example, somebody might say, well, I converted because of Joseph Ratzinger. I became a Catholic, conservative Catholic, whatever, because of Ratzinger. Okay, well... That, Fine, that may be, but now look at how many people did, did lost the faith because of him. Right? And that's why I said you always have to look at both sides of the ledger. It's it's not right to just focus on one thing and say, ha, there, there. See, he was orthodox and conservative and everything. Well, and I hope that if if anything from this podcast, again, you've opened people's eyes to at least, you know, not just going and, and just blindly saying that this man was a saint. I mean, go go and, and, and we'll attach links. And Mario hopefully will send me some of the links that he's got uh, that, mm -hmm. that he's been talking about today. And, yeah. and and that's why I love having you on, Mario, because you you provide legitimate resources. This isn't just your opinion. This isn't just, hey, you know, I don't like I don't like him. You know, it's a hey, this is these are things that, as you said, they're publicly known, publicly written, publicly stated. And, and again, that's what we hope people will, you know, have their eyes open a little bit. And Mario, I've got to run. I've got to have my house blessed. But I got to Wonderful. ask you one last one last question. Sure. Where do you think? And this is a big question, but but where do you think? What's going to happen now that that you know the Bene Vacantis can't exist anymore? What what do you think is going to happen with that that group of people who thought he was the only true pope? Yeah, I. I, of course, first of all, I don't know, <laughs> but I think that the, the, the movement is going to get a lot smaller now. I think a lot of people are just, essentially, I think you're going to have various um, uh, strains, if you will, uh, of that uh, persuasion. There will be some who'll say, okay, yes, I believe he was the true Pope and now he's dead. And, and now I'm just, now we have no Pope and, and, We'll just have to see what happens. I think that will be one uh, uh, type of uh, one uh, strain that coming out of the Benedict the Sixteenth as Pope movement. Uh, then others will say, "Well, we have to have a conclave," and you know, like Brother Alexis Bunyolo, who's currently making a fool out of himself uh, about that. 
And uh, then still others will probably say, well, now Bergoglio is really the Pope because whatever, maybe now he's, I don't know, publicly accepted or whatever. And then I think some will say that there is a secret successor to Benedict. I mean, you know that's coming. Yeah. And I wouldn't be surprised. If some, and I've said this for years, some will say that it's Arch Layman Garrick Genswein, the longtime secretary. Yeah, that um, that's, that's my guess, that some will say he, Benedict secretly uh, appointed him his successor. Because, see, the Pope, it, there doesn't have to be a conclave. The Pope can decide who his successor is going to be. He can just appoint him. Um and that's not the ecclesiastical law on the books in 1958, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but uh, that, that could, like, the Pope has that power. So all it takes is for somebody to, to argue or to say that Benedict XVI secretly appointed his own successor, and uh, that's, that man is now the real Pope, even if they de disagree about who that man is. So I think, for the most part, the it'll fizzle out. I think most people recognize there's no future in that movement, and they probably don't want to be Sidivacantus anyway. Um, not that they would be the same kind of Sidivacantus as, as we are now, right. but uh, in a similar situation. Um, and uh, so I think you'll have various... Different people will, will um, take different routes now, and there's, there's going to be no... A unified movement, and it's essentially becoming irrelevant now. My, that's my my guess. Well, Mario, I appreciate all that you do. I, I really appreciate you coming on. I, I think you you did a great job of of helping in in a one hour segment describe as best you can uh, Ratzinger, Pope Benedict Sixteenth, or quote unquote Pope. Um, how how can people find your work and follow you? NovusOrdoWatch.org is the main website with the blog and really everything you need. And then there's tradcast.org, which is the podcast. Um, and then you can, uh, I'm very active on Twitter. It's at Novos Ordo Watch. And uh, then I'm also on uh, Gab, Parlor, uh, Truth Social, and Getter, although there is not a whole lot of activity on those channels. It's mostly Twitter. And then uh, there's also Facebook. Novel Sorta Watch on Facebook, but I'm trying to kind of phase that out. Um, but still, I'm, I'm posting quite a bit of content there still. Perfect. Mario, I really appreciate it. And, and, and by the way, anyone who liked this show, please like, share, and subscribe. Share it with share it with someone that you think might be confused about, about you know, Benedict XVI. You know, maybe this will open their eyes a little bit and get them thinking, thinking, hey, maybe some of these things I thought I knew, I don't actually know. And that's the point. That's what I think Mario's primary purpose is. And his job, in many cases, I think, is trying to do just that. Let people know what they're missing and what is actually going on rather than what is being told to you. Mario, I hope we could do That's this right. again sometime. Um, maybe next time next time a pope dies or, 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 or an anti <laughs> a false pope dies or, or hopefully before then as well. Uh, but until then, God bless. Best of luck to you. And, and uh, yeah, we'll talk to you then. Thank you very much. God bless.